In the early 2000s, watching and creating AMVs were my thing. It was how I learned how to edit videos. When browsing animemusicvideo.org, Yes, I'm old. I saw a music video for a live action Sailor Moon, set to one of my favourite songs from the musical, La Moon. I watched transfixed and confused. What was this, a movie? Was it part of the musicals? I just had to know. So after some quick Googles, I found out that this show was called Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon. I looked all over for episodes and I found fan subbed versions that were on old video hosting sites that wasn't YouTube. Shout out to them because some of them still exist, which was actually quite nice to know. Anyways, people, please grab a snack or your favorite beverage because today is my birthday and we are once again talking about Sailor Moon. Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon. Creator of Sailor Moon, Nako Takauchi, has talked about how she was a big fan of Tokusatsu series like Kamen Rider and Super Sentai when she was younger and how they had a great influence on her creating her own all-girl Super Sentai manga. While those two series are the most popular and known outside of Japan, there are other Tokusatsu series with female leads that most likely had just as much of an impact on the creation of Sailor V and Sailor Moon. 1971 Tsukisuki Majo Sensei, which was about a moon princess, basically Princess Kaguya, who has a magical ring and about midway through the series transforms into a superheroine named Andro Carmen with the help of a magic compact. And in the late 80s and early 90s, there were three Tokusatsu magical girl shows that came out of the Toei Fushigi comedy series. Magical Chinese Girl Pai Pai, Magical Chinese Girl in Panima, and La Belle Mask Poitrine. The influence is as plain as day, especially when you look at the early concept art of the Sailor Senshi. Everyone was wearing some type of mask. Sailor Moon originally wore a mask in the first few chapters of the manga which she later discards. So Sailor Moon's manga and anime had both ended in 1997, but the popularity never completely died. The stage musicals, which had begun in 1993, were still going strong. TV execs at Toei took note of this when looking for a new live-action Magical Girl series that they could sell to a station Saturday morning lineup. By the late 90s and early 2000s, fighting Magical Girl anime and Magical Girl live-action series were now commonplace. So it was a no-brainer to expand the Sailor Moon franchise and produce a live-action TV series thus bringing the franchise full circle. A manga inspired by Tokusatsu was now being adapted into one. Just perfect. This time, Nako Takauchi would be more involved in the adaptation process. She always wanted to be from the start, but the anime's production was happening concurrently with the manga's production, and the same thing with the Bandai-produced musicals. Although I believe she was around during the early stages of the musical, so... Mm. Here, she was much more involved in the production throughout the series, including the casting of the main roles, and writing song lyrics and image songs, as well as the series theme song, Kirari Sailor Dream. Takauchi also designed the look of new characters like Princess Sailor Moon. And Sailor Luna. That's right, Luna becomes a Sailor Senshi. I also read that she wanted the Sailor uniform to keep some of the details that were in the manga. For example, if you look at the design for Sailor Jupiter, she has a bubble full of potpourri attached to a beaded chain on her waist, which she uses to perform the attack Flower Hurricane. Ray, Minako and Ami all have the little details too. And these are just, you know, little tiny things and Easter eggs that ardent Sailor Moon fans such as myself can spot. Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon would be a retelling of the Dark Kingdom arc from the manga. And retelling is the best way I would describe it too. The show ran from October 4th, 2003 to September 25th, 2004, consisting of 49 episodes called Axe, mimicking the manga's chapter's titles and two DVD specials. One of them was a movie that took place four years after the events of the final episode, and the second special was a prequel episode about the origin of Sailor V, and lastly, the two mini-episodes, one of them about the birth of Tuxedo Mask. Five directors worked on the series as a whole. Ryuta Tosaki, Masataka Takamaru, Kenzo Maihara, Nobuhiro Suzumura, and Takamitsu Sato. All of them have worked on different tokusatsu series and movies before PGSM. 
Takamaru and Mayuhara directed the bulk of episodes, including the specials. The series' lone writer was Yasuko Kobayashi. She is quite prolific. She has been the main writer on many anime and tokusatsu series and movies like Jojo's Bizarre Adventure and Mirai Sentai Time Ranger. <laughs> っていうところが1には3、4話までの苦労じゃないんですけど、実写するに実写化するにあたって考えていったところで、あと1、2話はすごくオーソドックスに本を作ったので、あとは田崎さんがまあ、あの滝を作るやとか、芋かい言われました
I already mentioned the tiny differences in the uniforms but also the colour schemes. Sailor Moon's uniform is much more pink like the manga and Sailor Mercury's pastel blue bob, I really like it. The choice of having the senshi appear very regular degular in the civilian form made the most sense. You can get away with the weird hair colours and animation to make the main characters instantly recognisable in a crowd, but in live action that isn't really needed, so here the side by side before and after transformation is made even more extravagant. Plus having them look so normal makes them much more relatable. So in the manga, the girls were obviously wearing some designer clothes like Chanel and Thierry Mugler, and here they are not, because budget obviously. But I do like the clothes that they are wearing, it's very casual, very 2000s, you know. And their personal style is different enough that you know who is who when they're first introduced. Like I knew this was Ami despite her having longer hair and wearing her glasses more often. But most importantly, their wardrobes don't consist of the colour of their superhero outfits. I feel the need to mention this. The first episode of PGSM will feel the most familiar if you read the comics and watched the anime, with just a few minor differences. Episode 1 does a good job of setting up the new yet familiar world of Sailor Moon. We get a glimpse of the major characters and the structure of how future episodes would go. Normal schoolgirl life and drama interrupted by the monster of the week with small hints of the series major plotline. It's clear that episode 1 had the biggest budget of the series. The first enemy that Sailor Moon fights is a monster that possessed Army's mother and it's this big CGI multiple hand having thing. Then there's a scene where Sailor V and Tuxedo Mask are leaping off of rooftops at night. And of course, there is the iconic CGI Luna plush voiced by Keiko Han, the same voice actress for Luna in the anime. Now when you think of Tokusatsu series, especially the popular ones, you can't help but think about the exciting action sequences, whether the characters are in their civilian form or in superhero mode. A series that may not be all that great can sometimes be remembered just for having really cool action scenes. Now PGSM, <laughs> the actresses playing the Sailor Soldiers, like I said this was their first major role in the drama. Maybe some had a little bit of an athletic or dance background, but I do know that they underwent a lot of training beforehand to perform some of the fight choreography. Unlike a Super Sentai or Kamen Rider where the actors could be swapped out with stunt doubles for the bulk of fight scenes as their faces are hidden under a helmet, the girls of PGSM did not have that luxury. The end result is a fighting style that many fans have dubbed Ballet Foo. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know. And look, if you thought I was going to sit here and defend the ballet foo, then you were absolutely right. And you know me so well. The ballet foo is only really there for the first 10 episodes. You get a sense that they were testing the waters and seeing what the young actresses could do, what their limitations were and what looked good on camera. And yes, it does look silly. So, so silly. But in a strange way, it actually kind of works. The music that they used in the fight sounds like they're about to take the stage rather than take down a monster. Yes, come through Princess Tutu. The actresses know that they look silly too, but they were so absolutely committed to it. And you end up going with the flow too, believing that all those moves are 100% super effective against those monsters. <laughs> They do away with the ballet fu and lean into a more dance fighting type of style and the choreography starts to resemble like maybe cheerleader routines or something like that. So expect to see loads of cartwheels and flips because those types of tumbling gymnastic moves are the types of moves that a teenager can pull off and it can still look very flashy and impressive on camera. I really have to commend the actresses because they said in interviews that they found it really hard to move in the costumes at first. The padded chest piece was quite restrictive and I'm sure the shoes did not help either. So they had some trouble hitting all their marks. <laughs> I'm 
これ大変だったよね。そうなのにさ、うん、すごい頑張ったと思うか。<笑>ショックだった。そうですよ。これめっちゃカットされてたじゃないですか。頑張れ。一番頑張ったとこですよね。そうそうそう。ね、何回も滑って滑って頑張って滑って滑って。Seeing the improvement of their skills and confidence throughout the series just makes me smile. I'm just like, wow, that was a really good looking kick. And you had a solid stance there too. And did you see that flip that she just did? The trampoline leaps? Oh my days, I could not tell if that was a stunt double or not. Now, one thing I wasn't a fan of was the soundtrack. Besides the theme song, none of the music really grabbed me. Except for maybe the final episode when the senshi are trying to stop the princess. But I guess I was just hoping for something more up tempo that could have really added something special to the action scenes. Particularly when they pivoted away from the ballet f o o you should never underestimate the power of a really good song to get you hype over a fight scene. <laughs> Moving on from that, the major strength of the series lies in how much more dramatic and character driven the storylines are, with most of the plot relying on the interpersonal drama of not only the protagonist, but the antagonist as well. PGSM was a chance to go deeper and explore these characters in new ways that were only hinted at in the manga and the anime. Those moments can range from melodramatic to heartfelt and just downright relatable. A running theme throughout Sailor Moon Media is that the Sailor team have all dealt with loneliness in one way or the other, until they met Usagi and were reunited with each other and realizing that their strength lies in their bond. I'd argue that this aspect is extremely important to the core of Sailor Moon, and no matter what an adaptation chooses to do, if that key component is missing, then you might as well throw the whole thing away. The first time I watched the series, I read on fan forums that it was such a fresh new story that it didn't matter if you had read every single chapter of the manga and watched every single episode of the 90s anime or seen every musical. You should cast aside all expectations. But it was honestly hard to do when it came to the first two episodes. But then I got to episode three, and that was the first sign that this show would be different, starting with the characters. Episode 3 is where Rei is introduced, and it's the same way how she was introduced in the manga and the anime, as this mysterious priestess that people are blaming for the disappearances that are happening near her shrine. After Rei is awakened at Sailor Mars and she and Sailor Moon and Mercury defeat the monster, the episode starts to come to a close, and Usagi gushes about them making plans to celebrate. But then this happens. <laughs> Believe me when I say, the first time I watched, I was stunned. Rei's personality resembled her manga counterpart, so she's much more of the level headed, cool, and mysterious type. But this was taking it a step further, and I had to know what was going to happen next. I mean, what a way to end the episode, that really hooked me in. As the episodes went on, Rei was shown to be a girl that was ostracized by her classmates and felt abandoned by her father, who is more concerned with his political career, and this has caused her to reject people before she can be rejected. Throughout the series, she has to learn how to be part of a team and how to accept friendship. Even though solitude is what she's used to, Rei ends up making a deep connection with Minako, and there were scenes that truly brought tears to my eyes. If you are a Venus and Mars shipper, then this here was made for you. 
Makoto has always been one of my favourite characters. She's the strong world girl because she was forced to be strong after being orphaned at a young age. That veneer of strength that she always had to put up has caused others to think of her as this pillar of constant strength that cannot be harmed emotionally. But we see her cry and we see her huge heart that wants to protect people, especially her friends who at the drop of a hat would do the same thing for her. <laughs> Makoto has always been a romantic, someone who yearns for love, and it was just really sweet watching this awkward romance blossom between her and the very quirky turtle obsessed Motoki. Ami, the shy, quiet, polite and serious girl and fan favourite. She's someone who craves friendship and connection with people as classmates have often mistaken her shyness for being arrogant. Her parents are divorced so she rarely sees her father and her mother is so busy that they rarely see each other and communicate by leaving each other notes on the kitchen whiteboard. Becoming a sailor senshi gave Ami something that she was good at besides studying and it brought her friendship and a sense of belonging. As friendship is something that is new to Ami, she is afraid of losing Usagi and goes as far as to study how to be a friend. It's why it comes as such a shock when Ami is kidnapped by Kunzai and is brainwashed into becoming one of the Dark Kingdom's generals. The most unassuming out of all the five has this whole mini arc of being evil. Kobayashi did a good job of weaving little threads of how Ami became vulnerable to the brainwashing and manipulation with little moments of Ami being taken for granted by all the other characters. I mean, it's not like this is wholly original and not even when it comes to Sailor Moon as this storyline bears some similarity to the Black Moon arc where Chubiusa is brainwashed by Wise Man and turns evil. But you know, it's all about the execution here. Minako has to have the biggest personality shift. In the manga of Sailor V and Sailor Moon, and even in the anime, she was this aspiring idol that was very athletic, bubbly, energetic and cheerful. She was fairly confident when it came to her duties as leader, since she was a sailor soldier for the longest and was therefore the most experienced, although that confidence did waver at times. Here, Minako is no longer an aspiring idol. She's a very popular idol. She is quiet and mysterious and has a rather cynical outlook on life. She rarely smiles and there's this sombre mood about her, which is understandable when you consider she is living a very complicated life of being a pop idol, a sailor senshi and dealing with a serious unnamed illness. As a result, Minako is fully dedicated to the mission and often prefers to work alone. <laughs> She selects Ray to be her successor, and their relationship starts off quite rocky but gradually grows as they work together. And Minako allows herself to become close with the team after going on some wacky hijinks with Fusagi, forgetting about her burdens and enjoy being a regular teenage girl. It did take a while, but it was so cathartic to finally have all five girls together as a unit, ready to stop Queen Beryl and the Dark Kingdom. But right before they can formulate their plan, Minako succumbs to her illness and dies. Sailor Ma's raw emotion of losing Minako is just gut-wrenching as she takes out all that rage she's feeling and unleashes it on a monster. Then there's Naru Osaka, a character in the manga that was really just there to be Usagi's normal best friend that she needed to save and quickly disappears into the background. In the anime, she had a lot more screen time. Whenever the show's villain of the week had to antagonise a character that the audience were familiar with, it was usually Naru. Naru was so often the perpetual target for monsters that there was even a self-referential joke about it. Naru did get a tiny arc where she became involved with Nephrite, which is quite problematic actually. How old are you, Mr. Evil Man? Because you are masquerading as a grown-ass man with a car and you were out here manipulating a 14-year-old. Yeah, you got redeemed by the end because you saved her, but uh, no, this episode still makes me cry. Anyways... Naru hints that she may know that Usagi is Sailor Moon before eventually fading into the background too. In PGSM, Naru remains a supporting character throughout the entire run of the show. 
we see her get upset that suddenly, out of nowhere, her best friend, presumably since primary school, is hanging out with a bunch of other girls and has to run off and cancel plans without telling her why. Of course she feels left out. This was all very relatable to my younger self. Towards the end of the series, Nari learns about Usagi's double life and accepts it. <laughs> あんな風に変身して戦ってるなんて全然言ってくれなかったじゃん。え。怪我なんかより <笑> I was happy to see Naru was present for Usagi and Mamoru's wedding along with their other classmates. She wasn't left behind. PGSM managed to do right by Naru. Lastly, I want to talk about Princess Serenity. During the Silver Millennium, the Moon Princess was what many expected her to be. Graceful, poised and kind. But after the death of Prince Endymion, she was utterly consumed by grief and destroys both the Moon and Earth Kingdoms. When the princess is finally awoken within Usagi, she is more akin to a malevolent spirit that is possessing her. The princess of old is gone, replaced by a person so cold, ruthless and selfish and obsessed with being with Endymion. She is so set on her one goal of being with him that she doesn't care who or what she ends up harming and is ready to destroy the earth once again because an earth without Endymion is useless. Usagi and Serenity are two very different people. With all her idealism, daydreams and childish nature, Usagi is a lot more mature and compassionate in comparison. She sees the earth as worth protecting. Princess Serenity and the Silver Crystal are so powerful that the energy that they expel has an adverse effect on all life forms and we see Usagi struggle to control Serenity and not let her take over. Both the Senshi and Dark Kingdom come to worry about Serenity's destructive powers, so much so that Zayla Venus partners with Zoysite. The final stretch of episodes sees characters show more concern over the actions of Princess Serenity rather than Queen Beryl and Queen Metallia. And that's when you suddenly realise that Princess Serenity is in fact the series' true villain. I truly loved this. The thing about adaptations is that of course I want to see my favourite moments from the source material be brought to life in the medium that it's being adapted into. That is what was exciting. But I never want a 100% absolute page to screen adaptation, especially with something that has had other adaptations before. When the opportunity presents you to do something new and shatter expectations, why shouldn't you take it? PGSM did that and now you can understand why it's so beloved among fans, with some even regarding it as the best adaptation of Sailor Moon out there. So I don't read or speak Japanese, so it's hard for me to research credible sources about the ratings. And I don't even know the first place to even start. Even using fan-based systems of, did this receive an official sub or dub, don't work here because there are so many popular titles in a variety of mediums in Japan that did not get an official translation for one reason or the other. Mother 3 comes to mind. And according to fan forums, Toei never intended for this to get any type of international release. So it's clear that PGSM never reached a level of popularity as the anime or the manga. And there are reports floating around online that this show was originally planned to have 52 episodes, but was cut short due to low ratings. And as a result, the ending was rushed and the straight to DVD movie was a way to just tie everything up and give a final send off to the characters. Now just because the series wasn't a major phenomenon, it doesn't mean that it didn't have its fans. The cast performed in many live shows for kids and they look like they are living for it. And a good deal of toys and merchandise were made based off the show. So I mentioned that the show never received any type of international translation. So it's thanks to fan subbers that have put in the work for us to even watch it. Shout out to Miss Dream, 
TV Nihon and Sea of Serenity for fan sub in this series. The footage I'm currently using for this video is coming from Miss Dream because that's the version I've had on my hard drive for the longest. <laughs> Who knows, maybe one day Toei's Tokusatsu official YouTube may decide to upload the entire series. But until then, the fan subs are the only way for English speakers to even watch. And I'm sure there are some Spanish and Italian fan subs floating around there. I've seen some over the years. I don't know where <laughs> to look, but I'm sure it's out there. Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon has aged gracefully. I look back on it as this silly, camp, funny little show that was so incredibly heartfelt and sincere. It suffered from some growing pains, but it gradually became better. You can feel that everyone working on the show was having fun. When watching all the behind the scenes content, you hear how much the cast truly bonded and hope that they would get the opportunity to work together again. <laughs> An express worry about when the show came to an end that they would no longer be as close as they all were. That was far from the case, as the main five would often reunite and celebrate each other's birthdays. Miyu Sobai and Ayaka Komatsu often meet up, and here they are wearing some Sailor Moon and Sailor Venus merch. And quite recently, they got together at the Sailor Moon Cafe. You know, it's kind of funny because Ayaka had never seen Sailor Moon prior to playing Sailor Venus, and has now become a full-on Sailor Venus fan. You'll see her post pics celebrating Sailor Venus's birthday. Rika Izumi and Miyu Azama are also pretty close too, and even gone on vacation together. Kiko Kitagawa, whose career really took off, I mean this woman stays booked and busy, still finds time to reunite with the cast. Acting wise, different cast members have crossed paths on the stage, movies, TV shows and even other tokusatsu series. While researching, I learned that three cast members were in a recent Super Sentai series. Seeing them side by side, all older and finer, was really nice. The reason why Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon gets brought up when talking about live action adaptation of Winx Club and Powerpuff Girls is that despite its many flaws, it was able to capture the essence and it was made by people who understood and respected the source material. It stayed true to the heart of the series while managing to create something new and build upon the foundation that was laid out for them. They knew how to balance being silly, sincere and self-aware. Not a moment went by where I felt that they were embarrassed about the source material. When it comes to live action adaptations, to me, PGSM is A tier. The Adams Family is like S tier, but you know. <laughs> and look, if any other Magical Girl series, outside of Japan anyways, is planning on doing a live action series, you might want to take a look at the pretty guardian in a sailor suit. I have to big up all the Sailor Moon fan sites because without them, I would have been lost. These fan sites and fan forums have been around since the late 90s and early 2000s, so it was really a nostalgia trip just looking back at all of them. So, did you watch Pretty Goddy and Sailor Moon? Did you like it? Did you hate it? Did you even know it existed? Today is the 30th anniversary of the Sailor Moon anime, and I'm just really wondering what the official Sailor Moon accounts are going to say, what they're going to announce today. It's my birthday, meaning I'm going to relax and just disappear for a few days. <laughs> But before I do, I just want to thank all my patrons who helped make this video a bit easier for me to focus on. So thank you to Cheyenne Lin, Haryana Hook, Kemi, Mariah, M Zaid, and Jewel Fins. Bye bye now.